my pleasure to join you. At the Lawyers Committee, we work every day on behalf of individuals who face barriers to advancement. Those barriers could exist in the education arena, it exists in the employment arena, it exists in health care, voting rights even. And so it's really a privilege for us. We provide direct services to clients. We also do impact litigation, but we rarely have an opportunity to talk with folks like you without any litigation pending. So we really appreciate this opportunity to engage in this dialogue and discussion and to talk about this really important issue in a way that shares information, talks about what the legal ramifications are for the data that we found in the Held Back Report, and also talks about ways that you can avoid liability. So that really is the overview of what we want to talk about for the next few moments. And I want to go directly into the Held Back Report. You all have a copy of that um, on your um, desk uh, there in front of you. And I want to just begin by looking at what we were focused on uh, in the report. So this report really looks at a very discreet issue. And the discreet issue had to do with Algebra One placement in the eighth grade, students who successfully passed Algebra One in the eighth grade, they scored B or better uh, in, uh, in terms of a grade, and then they also scored above basic, so proficient or advanced on the California standardized test. Those students who successfully passed eighth grade Algebra One should have been advanced, we would expect, in the ninth grade to geometry. We have an issue though, a major, major problem, because many students were in fact not advanced. So our report findings were these, and I wanna take each of them one by one and look at exactly what the challenges were and what the concerns were for us as we looked at the um, data that came out of the Pathways Report that was funded by the Noyce Foundation. Steve Waterman, we appreciated the great work that he did because he had an opportunity to work very closely with nine districts in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties, looking very closely at the data tracking student movement from eighth grade to ninth grade. And so we got really great information about the placement trends uh, from that report in addition to publicly available testing data. So if we look at um, some of the findings in the report, what was most astounding to us is that in the Pathways uh, study, the data suggests that students were pretty evenly spread in eighth grade Algebra one. You had a pretty fair representation of African American, Latino, Asian, and white students taking Algebra one in the eighth grade. However, when you look at the student movement trajectory to geometry in the ninth grade, there were significant variances in terms of student advancement. And I wanna talk about those numbers really briefly. So for um, African American students in the eighth grade, 52.6% of students, African American students were in algebra one in the eighth grade. However, when you look at the representation of African American students in ninth grade geometry, the number dropped to 17.8%. We can look at Latino students, and there were 50.7% of Latino students in eighth grade Algebra one. When you look at what happened to those students moving forward in ninth grade, the number dropped drastically to 16.5% of students advanced to geometry in the ninth grade. So 50.7% Latino students taking Algebra one in the eighth grade, dropping to 16.5% advanced to geometry in the ninth grade. That is astounding and troubling to us. <coughs> we wanna know what's going on there. As well, as you might think, look at it also a little bit differently, you've got underrepresentation in our view of students of color advancing to geometry, but you might have overrepresentation of Asian students advancing to geometry. Right, if you look at the data, the data suggested that 52.9% of Asian students were in eighth grade algebra one. When you look at the percentage of Asian students advancing to geometry in the ninth grade, it was 
So 52.9% taking algebra one in the eighth grade and 51.7% taking geometry in the ninth grade. Now, there's a couple questions I would urge us to ask. If, that, if we think that student, Asian students are that successful and face no challenges when it comes down to mathematics, there might be some assumptions that we might be making about those students. And it might be implicit, it might be unconscious, but if it's not causing us to question why there is such a small, only 1% of those students subject matter. Um, didn't advance. But the reality we is, actually in the data that we found, of all of the students who were forced to retake Algebra one in the ninth grade, 60% of those students scored proficient or higher on the California standardized tests. More than 42% of them that were forced to retake Algebra one in the ninth grade received a grade of B minus or better. So this is not an issue of mastery of material. These kids made a successfully passed Algebra one, one in the because I just didn't think they really mastered the subject matter. I know they performed well, but I think it will serve them well to retake Algebra one. The reality is, is that that recommendation in and of itself to cause that student to have to repeat algebra one in the ninth grade really upsets that student's path to opportunity for a lifetime for a lifetime as you all full well know you know better than i do that the indicators of success access and success in college has everything to do with math placement uh, in the ninth grade so let's talk about the legal ramifications of this information Disparate impact. Disparate impact law is a legal theory that tries to take a look at the consequences of policies and practices. So there's intentional discrimination, and we don't think that any teacher, any educator is out there saying, oh, I'm gonna intentionally keep this kid out of advancing to geometry. Of course, if the data suggests otherwise, we, we will point it out. But we don't really think that that's really overwhelmingly what's happening. We think, though, that there are policies and practices in place that appear facially neutral. These are policies and practices that apply to every student equally, right? So you might look, rely on teacher recommendations, you might rely on grade performance, you might rely on standardized testing. There might be all kinds of indicators that you look at that applies equally to all students, but yet those policies and practices have a disproportionate adverse impact on certain groups of students. So I want to do talk and in about this case, what was astounding to us was the adverse impact. So for organizations like ours, when we see data like that, where there is a disproportionate number of Latino and African American students being held back and not advanced to geometry, we want to take legal action. We say, what, something is happening here. These students are being discriminated against. But in this well, instance, we have an opportunity to, to advance to litigation to, share to bring what's called a prima facie case. And in terms of a prima facie case of, uh, to prove our point, we would have to start by showing a few very basic elements. One, that you're an entity that receives federal or state funds. Of course, that's the case. You're a public school district. Secondarily, that you have a practice in place that is facially neutral. So it's not singling out any one group of students one group of students, it actually applies to all students broadly. But that practice that you have in place that's facially neutral has a disparate impact on certain classes and groups of students. In this case, African-American and Latino students that we're, that we're talking about. Now, we bring that case, we make that argument. The court says, all right, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, sounds like you've got a case on your hands. Well then, what then happens after that? The way the law works is the burden then shifts to the school district. And the school district then, after we would put on our case, would have an opportunity to demonstrate that there's a subject, substantial legitimate justification for the practice that's in place. So in, in this case, what concerns us most of all is that when we looked at the primary factor influencing student placement in the ninth grade, that subjective input was actually overriding objective <laughs> evaluation measures. 
So students were performing well on the standardized tests, above basic, but teacher recommendations could actually override the standardized test performance and end up having a student to be held back. So the school district would have to explain to me, to the court, to the public, what <coughs> is it about teacher recommendations that is so essential, so critical, that it really creates a legitimate justification for holding students back. Our argument is that as a district, that would, you would not get very far. Um, regardless of, you, you might say that, well, teachers are on the front lines, they have the best information about student performance. That is actually right. It's not that that would be incorrect, but the reality is, is that there are other districts who have implemented policies and practices that have minimized the adverse impact that subjective teacher recommendations can have. So for you to stand behind and argue that the teacher recommendation really is the bellwether for whether or not you'll advance students, we don't believe you get very far uh, in the court of law. But even if the court were to buy the justification that you were presenting, we would still be able to prevail. Plaintiff students and their families would still be able to prevail if we were able to show that there were equally effective practices in place so that teacher recommendations may be taken into account. However, those recommendations would not be, uh, would not be able to hold a student back, but would only be able to advance a student, right? So that the subjective evaluations from a teacher would not be able to limit a student's uh, placement or their opportunity to advance, but it would only be able to help them advance. So what's the big deal with subjective decision making? What's so concerning about it? What's so troubling about it? And I want to be really clear that this issue with subjectivity is a challenge across arenas. It's not limited to the school environment. We see this issue in employment. We see it in the provision of health care. It is just the reality of who we are as human beings, that we have biases. Right, I can raise my hand and say I'm not racist. I work at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, right? And this is what I do every day, is fight discrimination. But the reality is, is I have biases, just like anyone else have, has biases. It's the way our brains are wired, it's the way it works. And so we really have to be mindful of invisible dangers of unconscious bias and stereotyping. I'm sure you all are very familiar with stereotyping. If you haven't had an opportunity to really look into the neuroscience and <coughs> social cognition processes related to unconscious bias, I really urge you to do so. It's really fascinating work about how the mind operates automatically. And before you know it, you've already rendered a decision or a judgment that will impact your actions going forward. And just to give you an example of how the mind works very quickly, this is a real easy example. When you all saw me, you made an automatic assessment that I'm female, that I'm African American. You didn't stop to think about that, right? You didn't stop and ask yourself, what is this? Hopefully you didn't. What is this standing in front of me, right? Is this human? Is this animal? Is this male? Is this female? No. You saw me and you, you moved on. You didn't even stop to ponder really about Kimberly is female, she's African American, right? Your brain automatically did that work for you. So we have processes, maps encoded in our minds based on our experiences, our life experiences and what we've been exposed to that help us to just process information on a constant ongoing basis. And that can oftentimes be bias-ridden, and we need to be aware of that.